and welcome to this afternoon's session. So at, before we start, I'd like to introduce our panel members. Um, we have on my right, uh, Rob Kerrin. Rob is the chair of the Primary Producers SA in a range of other boards and committees, including Regional Development SA. He has, a, has had a long interest in regional South Australia and economic development, and his passion is growing exports to underpin this regional development. So welcome, Rob. We also have Ben Bruce. Ben Bruce is the Group Executive Director of the Department for Water and Environment. His interest is water, of course, and his passion is exploring the range of benefits that can come from combining water and yeast. Thanks, Ben, for that contribution. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we have uh, Greg Ingleton. Greg is the Business Development Manager for Environmental Opportunities for SA Water. His interest is in demonstrating simple and different ways we can make a difference with water coupled with the holistic economic benefits that can be obtained. His passion is to change the world and, well, the part that water plays in the world. So welcome to all our panellists. I think we've got a great um, group of people who will bring a very different perspective to this issue. So the, the challenge that we're looking at today is a very broad one. Water will continue to underpin our society and climate change is likely to reduce water availability and increase variability. Population growth will increase water demand, stimulating economic development will require more water resources. So interest and investment into water management and science is declining. So we need to do more with less, but the question we're looking at is how. <coughs> the way that we're going to run this is I'm going to ask a couple of questions to the panel and then I'm going to open it up for a Q&A from the audience. So uh, when we do that, you, need, um, you know, just put your hand up, say where you're from and so forth. But I'll start with first uh, a question, and I'm going to start with a question to Rob to begin with. So Rob, throughout your career you've had the opportunity to look across most of the primary producing industries and regions and you've seen their growth and in some cases their decline. With this experience, can you pick two of the most pressing and consistent water challenges that you believe will face primary producers in the future and maybe tell us a little bit about why you've picked those two? Uh, thanks Rachel. Um, two pretty pragmatic problems. One is the issue of water security to do with the Murray-Darling and the other is alternative water uh, for non-irrigated areas. As far as the Murray-Darling Basin goes, I think the big challenge is the politics has taken over with it. Um, we really, uh, by the grace of uh, the other states, get water at all. Constitutionally, uh, the federal government are quite sort of restricted in what they can do. So us cooperating as much as we can with the other states is really important. Um, if they were to walk away from the table, then we'd be in real strife. So uh, I think that's a, a huge challenge going forward. Climate change, whatever's going to make that worse. Uh, so there's got to be a lot more cooperation than we perhaps uh, sometimes see. The other one is um, the livestock industry is one that's really grown uh, dollar-wise in South Australia. And yet a lot of that is uh, relying on reticulated water. Now reticulated water costs a lot to send around the states. I'm not having a crack at SA water. But um, it's getting that way that if in fact we were to lose a couple of our markets and the stock prices came down, it would not be viable to run livestock in a lot of South Australia. So um, ourselves and uh, PERSA are working towards trying to give farmers some solutions as to how they can actually uh, catch more of the water on their properties or find other ways of uh, ensuring their viability going forward. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. There's really two... Each of those answers are probably warrant a large conversation, but the key thing I thought that came out of that um, out regarding water security is cooperation and working together and also with the livestock is, again, probably cooperation and innovation and solutions are needed, so as an interesting thing. Um, Greg, I'm going to ask you now, come over to the left. You're a huge advocate for water recycling, storage and reuse. Um, yes, but put, putting aside the well-known benefits that we probably traditionally think about when we think about water recycling, what are the lesser-known benefits that you believe offer potential for the future? Um, and, you know, can you tell about what they are and what you think we need to do to do more with those opportunities? So I'll... I'll look at this as a, in an urban sense, and um, I'm not going to the rural side uh, just yet. Um, 
one of the things that we're really interested in is just the health benefits that you can get from um, using water differently in your urban environment. So using it to cool the environment down. Um, we're doing a fair bit of research now on just how much water you need to apply to keep your house cool, to keep your park green and cool. Um, so it's really about private and public open space and what the contribution of that coolness would be to, say, reductions in um, hospital admissions on hot days. Um, and coupled with that, you've got all these other benefits of keeping your house looking nice, keeping your, your lawn green, you can grow urban food, um, improving property values, and it's really, I suppose, just a way that we can all work together to actually start to make a difference. The thing that really interests me is I've been doing some experiments at home and um, I do a lot of experiments because I like to find out the unknown unknowns and it's just a way that you can you do something, you a, a bit of a applied research I suppose and, um, and what I'm finding is that if I use a little bit of water I save a lot of energy. So if I put the sprinkler on and have the kids running around under the sprinkler and I've got a green lawn and I've got a green veggie patch and green trees then the kids are going to go outside and play instead of sitting inside with the air conditioner on which costs five times more than the water does that I'm using. And the impact of that on our um, infrastructure as well is quite dramatic. Um, I'm not advo advocating that we use more water, I'm just suggesting that we use it differently and we start to be smart about the way that we use it. Thanks. Excellent. <coughs> Um, ben, your role really provides you with a chance to have a helicopter view across the state and what's going on at that big picture perspective. So I suppose I'm interested in, in that perspective um, about our water resources. So we have climate change, population growth, increased agriculture, mining productivity, all of these things are putting greater pressure on our limited resources. So I suppose from your perspective, um, can you comment on how you think we're going to meet these future water demands? Thanks for the small question, Rach, that's good. Um, so I think a lot of it is about um, our knowledge, you know, exploring our knowledge base, innovation, and there's so much that we don't know still. So if you look through the, the far north of the state, many areas where we have unprescribed resources, you know, we're finding out things about them all the time. So there's untapped resources there. There's the way we use water differently. So um, a lot of industries, we use water once, um, we can use it several times. Um, so, so a lot of that innovation and innovation about how we, how we think about water, um, I guess one of the things we know within our, within our organisation is the change from a historical focus on potable supply to now many industries looking at resources that act, don't need to be at potable quality. And so changing our mindset to be water is water is water. It's just what you do with it then. So a, ra a range of things, you know, exploring that water and energy, energy nexus. Um, we can get water to all sorts of places plenty of the uh, world has shown us to do that. It's just a cost and that could be in dollars, it can be in environment, it can be social impact, a range of other things. So as we move forward, I think we can do it, but we just need to have open conversations with communities, with industries, um, taking the environment into account so we can balance things up. N noting that new balances will probably be required as we uh, deal with climate change. With uh, something I'm noticing across all of the answers, and while they're quite different questions, is a common theme of we need new innovative solutions, we need to make choices, we need to think about how we use water differently, and it, you know, it can open up opportunities if we do that, we'll need to make choices about it, but also we need to look at innovation and science to help us do that. So. With that in mind, I'm going to first ask Rob about from the business perspective. So you um, work with many businesses who are having to deal with this right now, particularly out in the regions adapting to climate change. Can you think or tell us a little about any of those innovative solutions that you're seeing now on the ground that you think have some f hope for the future? Yeah, for the last two years I've chaired a uh, South Australian River Murray Sustainability uh, Committee with $265 million to give out as grants. Uh, in return for, for, for water savings. Uh, and there's a whole range of uh, things that have come out of that, whether it be probes, changing crop, uh, a whole range of things. But the one that really stood out to me is we gave a couple of uh, uh, you know, multi-million dollar grants for shea cloth. And anecdotally, we were getting back uh, 
that they were saving. They reckon they were saving about 30% of the water. Now, if that's true, and we've made a condition of some of the later grants that they give access to the researchers, and we put some of the research money that was in that bucket into doing that research, because if, in fact, you can get 30% saving by putting a cover over the crop, then that opens a big possibility going forward, because if the payback on that was to be, say, two and a half years or whatever, then why wouldn't you do it? So we could see a river land, which is a, a different colour in a few years uh, from the sky. But uh, I think that's a really interesting one. It's not as high tech as some people would look at other solutions, but I think that's a really practical one and showing a hell of a lot of promise. That's a really interesting one because it, also, it really lends well to the things that I think Greg's been talking about. Um, but also from my understanding of some of those projects, they're also getting other improvements in the quality of the product uh, as well um, through some biodiversity improvements and just general overall quality. So it has these multiple benefits. Um, yeah. yeah, like um, they're getting premiums because you know, less bird damage, less weather damage, less sunburn. Um, and that's part of the research is to, to factor that in as well because that will again reduce the payback time. And if in fact we can really prove this up, then I think we should be going back to the federal government looking for a program to hasten uh, the implementation of that. So that leads in really well to you, Greg. A very similar question, um, really, asking the same, but from your perspective uh, about, you know, water recycling, urban water recycling, when it's being, can you see the day when it's being used, stored and reused, and what are some of those solutions, that are innovative solutions that are going to get us there? Um, yeah, just building on Rob's, Rob's answer, it's, it's the simple things um, that actually get us to where we want to be. My belief is that all the technology is out there, all the gadgets, all the, the software and whatever, but we just haven't brought it together for the right purpose and we're, we're starting to realise that now and we're starting to explore different you know, soil moisture probes to reduce our water use as well. So we're getting a bit smarter with the way that we use our water. Um, it's, yeah, it's really about just building on that and, and trying to, um, I suppose with the question, is it's about the use of alternative water. We can, we've got a fair bit of water around. We've got off an urban area, we've got about enough water that flows into the sea from stormwater and from, um, from treated wastewater to irrigate 20,000 hectares of land. That's a, a lot of land. Um, and that's a lot of jobs and a lot of revenue. We don't have the infrastructure to do that. Uh, we don't have the land to do that close to the city. But it's just an interesting um, thought to think, well, we do have a fair bit of water. We, don't, we shouldn't be using potable water for, air, for things that we don't need potable water for. I think one of the things that I'm quite excited about at the moment is, um, my belief is Adelaide is probably the best city in Australia for the ability to capture and reuse our treated wastewater and our stormwater. We've got aquifer systems, we've got all of, and we've got the infrastructure there and we've got our infrastructure positioned in the right places. All we need is the ability and a change in governance and, and thinking about those different water sources to be able to use the right water for the right purpose. And I think we'll get some big changes then. Ben, um, I'm going to again take a question that's a little bit leading on from that. I've heard a lot of we, with innovation, s simple solutions, but critical to that is gaining agreement so whether that be, I think Rob talked about, um, cooperation across states, whether that be uh, a social licence to implement these use water for different uses, and you've also talked about choices. Can you comment on what we need to do to um, how we work with the communities to gain agreement? So water allocation plan is, thing is obviously critical to this, um, but sometimes just getting agreement on how to allocate water isn't enough. So how, any thoughts about what we need to do in terms of engaging with communities to gain social licence and agreement going forward to make some of these hard decisions we have to do? Yeah, thanks, Rach. Um, I think it's a fundamental importance. I mean, we've seen across the state where we've had to do reductions in different places, and so those places where that's worked really well has been where we've been able to engage the community well, um, explain the situation, answer questions, have them give us information, so the local knowledge is really important and then develop solutions together. 
And where we've done that, they've been quite successful. I think where we haven't done that so well, and there's been various reasons for doing that, um, that's where we've struggled. I think probably in this day and age where people have access to information, or so much information, um, but not necessarily a way to determine which is um, trustworthy information, which is real, or um, like all of us will have biases in the information we provide, but what, understanding what those biases are from the different information sources um, so people can make informed decisions. And so I think our challenge, particularly as government, is to make sure that when we're working with communities we're enabling a two-way conversation um, and that people understand what we're trying to do um, and then even potentially modify that as we go along. So there may be some tweaking to those goals as we all collectively learn more own that, have get clarity about what success looks like and what we're going to achieve, and then work out a program to go towards that. I think the, probably the other thing is too is making sure there's enough um, review points in there so that people can come back and say, well, this is what I'm seeing on the ground. Is this what we expected to see? If not, do we need to adjust? Just so people are involved in that process. In fact, that ability to adjust can be some of the times the bravest thing to do, isn't it? To be willing to say, okay, we got that bit wrong. Um, I'd like to open it up now to the audience for questions. So if you do have a question, please put your hand up and you know stand up and so forth. And um, Kana, how we is <laughs> one of these or yep, we've got it. As that's going up to the first question, uh, and we can come back to this. But I did want to also pose the question of. You know, this panel is being hosted or um, sponsored by the Goiter Water Research Institute. What is the role of science um, in solving some of these challenges? Because we've talked about a whole lot of things about innovation, about c uh, community involvement, making choices. And I'll put that to the panel. Um, I might actually start with Rob in terms of what his thoughts are about the role going forward of science and then we'll take the question. Well, from, yeah, from where I sit, a lot of the water science is about efficiency, you know, about getting the, the greatest productivity out of the amount of water we've got. And that goes you know, from all the measuring the, the, the moisture so you're not watering when you don't need to, uh, you know, through probes and different ways of irrigating, you know, the underground irrigation, things like dripper hoses, um, and the shade cloth, you know, like the, the, the measurement of how we get the greatest growth out of it. And that, you know, science plays a really important role in ensuring we get that uh, maximum efficiency. Sure. Um, I think there are probably a few different ways I look at it in that there's the, the science that drives the innovation, like how do we do things differently. And there's the science that develops our understanding of the resources so we actually know or we can forecast model um, scenarios to work out what might happen, we want to avoid perverse outcomes. Um, things. And then there's also the science around the, uh, I guess, adaptive management monitoring going forward. So I think that's sort of three distinct areas that are, are equally important. But as someone who's been in the science area and in the policy area, um, for me, I feel much more comfortable and confident when we're making policy decisions, when I understand the basis that we're making them on and any assumptions that are there. It's when we don't have that that I feel somewhat exposed when we're making decisions because we have to make decisions at times. So. Uh, plant breeding is really important. You know, that's uh, you know, varieties that, that need less water, uh, create more fruit with less foliage, that type of thing. Uh, that's a really important one. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty much been covered. I, I, my, my only comment would be that we've got the pure research, the, there needs to be a line of sight from the pure research to the on ground activity, so you need to go through that applied process to actually do the on-ground trials and and then get the communication out there. The science industry, which I'm part of as well, doesn't often communicate all that well, um, so we just need to get the message out. Traditionally, stormwater is totally separate to household water here and it just goes out to sea. Now we're trying to harvest it and there's this purple pipe system where it's non-potable water has been sent to some houses in the northern suburbs like Salisbury and that but it's duplicating the amount of piping and therefore increasing the chance of risk of, of leaks and that. So I'm, I'm just wondering, before we go too far down that path, what's the benefit of actually going back to the drawing board and putting all the water straight into the sewers to the water treatment plant and then you haven't got any variation 
and you've only got the one system going to the houses. And okay, you're, you're making water potable that doesn't necessarily have to be, but it would save doubling up on the system. Uh, the cost of the treatment plant would actually be a hell of a lot more in the treatment process than the pipes themselves. And that's the, you know, if all the water, the stormwater and the wastewater was diverted to the treatment plant, you're, all of a sudden, you're treating 10 times more water. Um, and so it's more than 10 times the cost. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's a huge cost. Um, I have my views on the, the purple pipe. I, I, it's not, it's been shown not to be um, economically sustainable to go to houses, but when it goes to reserves and to the bigger users, the bigger non-potable users, it has a real benefit to both the potable network and the community. I, we're starting to experiment with um, the trading of water, the ability to be able to, to give a council some potable water in return for them giving us some storm water that we can then mix with the recycled water um, so that we can then put that out to farms and reduce the salinity of the recycled water. So in that scenario, everybody wins. It's just a concept at, at, the, at this, this stage, um, but it's just one of those ways that we can think about alternative water in a different way and what the benefits we can have on all the networks can be from, from including everything in the mix, not physically, but just um, on paper. We're very short on time, so we'll take one more question at the front here, I think. That's it, yeah. What about underground water? I was just wondering, uh, my understanding is the underground water, especially in the Adelaide region, has been very depleted and polluted and so on. I was just wondering if there's much research going into um, making our underground water sustainable. Um, it's, it's varied, I guess, because there's different levels of aquifers under the city. So a lot of the attention that's been in the press has been around the very shallow aquifers, um, backyard bores and some disposal from um, historic industry, which is quite different to the aquifers, the deeper tertiary aquifers that a lot of our industry is using. Um, in terms of those deeper aquifers, um, that they've been prescribed and there's a process at the moment to go through to develop a, a water allocation plan. Um, and that also involves the um, Northern Adelaide Plains, which has already been done. But there's certainly um, cones of depression through, um, which we're trying to manage um, in a proactive way. So a lot of the analysis, a lot of monitoring and analysis is done on those aquifers. Um, in terms of the other ones, uh, it's probably more a question for the EPA. I'm not sure on what research is being done on the shallower ones, but we certainly pay quite a bit of attention to the deeper ones. Okay, um, we are running out of time, so unfortunately we can't take any more questions. Um, in a wrap-up though, I'm just going to ask each of the panelists, firstly thank you for making the time and for your contribution, it's been really interesting. Um, if, in 15 words or less, so you've really got to keep it brief, if you could pick each pick one aspect of water management that you would like South Australia to be known as a world leader in, what would it be? Uh, maximising the productivity that we get out of that water. I'd just say balance, um, managing social, environmental, economic. I think if we can maximise all of those, and we're known for that, which we are to a degree already, um, but we can promote that, that would be a success for me. Um, be the leaders, which we sort of are anyway, um, but particularly on the economic side of it, you can do some smart economics to actually get a lot of these cases, uh, business cases over the line. Um, so I think we need to be focusing on that a bit more so we can convince people to invest. All right, and thank you. So once again, if everyone could put their hands together to thank the panel for their attendance. <laughs> and uh, thank you to the Gorda Institute for Water Research for sponsoring this event. Thanks a lot.